Okay, we are starting. Uh, so good morning, everybody. It's great to have you back with us again. Um, I think I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Uh, let me see here. My computer is lagging a little bit. Here we go. So, you know, welcome to our second garden committee seminar or webinar. Uh, I, first, I just wanted to go over some of these session norms and maybe we can all introduce ourselves and then we'll go over uh, the agenda for the day and then we'll, we'll get right into it. So as we're spending time together on Zoom this morning, uh, just beware of uh, your mute button. If you'd like to speak up and say something at any point, you're welcome to. Uh, you know, you can just unmute yourself if you have a question, but but it's often a good idea there at the bottom of your screen as you scroll your your cursor down there to just mute yourself, you know, in case so, uh, a train starts to go by in the background or something. We don't all have to hear it. <laughs> uh, and then uh, if if you're comfortable doing so, you're very welcome to turn your camera on. It's always nice to see each other's faces. Uh, just you know, fosters more interaction, but uh, but you know, no pressure to do so. Um, and then, if uh, if you could right now uh, interact with the chat box, uh, type in your name, where you're coming from, and uh, what you're hoping to learn more about today, maybe you know why, why you're joining in. Uh, again, the chat option should be found there. If you bring your cursor to the bottom, it's kind of looks like a little speaking bubble that you can click on and then you can type in messages. We'll be utilizing the chat function throughout today's seminar. So uh, you know we'll be throwing prompting questions out there and you can type in responses and thoughts there. So, so yeah, I'm gonna type in a message currently. It says, hello, there it is. And Julie just typed in something to the chat too. Thanks, Julie. Uh, well, speaking of Julie, let's do some staff introductions uh, while you guys type in some of your information into the chat as well. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Matthew Romans. I'm the program and education specialist here for the Greater Lansing Food Bank's Garden Project. I take care of developing some educational materials and making sure that people feel like they're equipped to do what they need to do throughout the gardening season to get a decent harvest. And, uh, and the program is pretty vague. I, I do other things within the program too, as we help to facilitate and foster uh, a lot of different community gardens within the greater Lansing area, within our five county region. So uh, then I'll, I'll kick it to Stevie. And, uh, and then Julie after that. Julie, uh, once you give your, well, actually, never mind. We're, we're gonna go into an agenda after that, but then then after that, you'll start talking, Julie, because you'll, you'll start to get into some content. So anyway, Stevie, it's all you. Okay. Um, I'm Stevie Riley. I'm the New American Engagement Specialist for Garden Projects. So I mostly work with um, New Americans, refugees, immigrants, helping source culturally important plants, seeds, make sure things are available in uh, the right language, that kind of stuff. My name is Julie Lehman. I'm our garden project manager. Um, I've been on staff at Food Bank for about 10 years and always with garden project and always growing and learning each year, mostly from the gardeners. So um, we just really welcome you to participate today, ask questions we want you to leave um, today at 1130 feeling like, yep, that's why I showed up. I got some questions answered. So just feel free to reach out to us. We love your questions and your um your feedback. Happy to be with you today. Okay. I okay. I'll try to get my cursor working a little bit faster. <laughs> the agenda for today is uh welcome and agenda. There we're we're right there. We're in the middle of it. That's the that's, that's what, if, if there was a map, uh, so you are here. Um, so that's the first point. Uh, and then uh, Julie's about to give us a review of the Garden Committee Toolkit and what we're doing this year with that. We talked a little bit about that uh, during our our kickoff seminar last month. 
And then, uh, so we'll do a little bit of a review right there. And then we will be sharing some tools uh, for the throughout the rest of our time. Those uh, tools are gonna be on how to really dive into member recruitment, uh, how to dive into registration, member communication, workday coordination uh, with volunteers and, uh, and you know, gardeners from within your garden, and then uh, how to be a liaison with garden project uh, and how to set good garden goals. Uh, that, that can be important too for just getting you connected to resources at garden project. The garden goals is of course important for any garden. And then at the very end, we're gonna have a time for just kind of a, a good summary of everything that we just covered and more space for any questions that you might have. After each one of these little sections that I just outlined, member recruitment, registration, and so forth, there's time for you to ask questions, respond to the prompts that we have as well. So again, just like Julie was saying a moment ago, feel free to interact and uh, shoot a question out there at any point. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, kick it off to you, Julie, get us going. And then you can just let me know when you want me to move ahead to different slides. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Will do. Thank you, Matthew. So um, I think as some most of you know, some of you know, Garden Project Program of Greater Lansing Food Bank, um, working to support uh, home gardeners and community gardeners in growing their own food. So right now in our network, there are about 30 collective acres in production in community garden settings. Um, Many of those are in the Greater Lansing area, but we do serve seven counties, uh, the Tri-County Greater Lansing area, and then North to Clare. And to Stevie's point, why we're so pleased to have Stevie's support here, over 40 languages um, spoken in the gardens. And we share that to, yes, languages is interesting and that's part of our community, but you can think about all those cultures with all their own specific um, food traditions. And um, we get to see that. Uh, reflected in the community gardens as well, um, and also in our greenhouse and what we're growing and being able to share out with the community. And then what, how that translates to the dinner table, um, over a million pounds of produ produce estimated grown this last year, um, small scale uh, intensive agriculture, sustainable agriculture is just highly productive. So um, when that you feed that soil, um, it really comes out in those vegetables grown. And we were able to see that across the gardens. Um, and then, yes, that's, that's a snapshot of the community garden network, but over uh, 6,500 uh, low-income home gardeners supported. And a lot of that looks like garden to go bags sent out to our pantries and agencies, and then um, support happening at our Garden Project Resource Center, uh, which is just on the east side of Lansing and will open up for the season in April. Um, and so you're meeting three of the six of us today. You can go to the next, Matthew. Um, you'll see in the picture there our resource coordinator, Mike, um, our propagation specialist, Janet, our administrator, um, Martha, and then uh, behind Martha in the pink shirt is our, our intern. And we are um, next. Uh, just go ahead and I need to come up with a snappy way to say it because I do have just I'll go next. Yep. We are hiring our um, garden and greenhouse specialists. If you know of anyone, please go to our website. We've got um, both that position and an internship to work at our uh, garden project resource center and an AmeriCorps position posted. So seasonally, we have great ways to get um, new folks connected. All right, next. So, oh. Matthew alluded to this. We've we're, we've created a new garden committee toolkit. We're trying to transition from uh, one or two community gardens to uh, leaders to a shared committee with shared tasks. Um, on our garden leader page, which we'll be digging into uh, momentarily, you'll be able to see a breakdown of those. Um, Task. And actually, if you go to the next slide, Matthew, we'll jump right into that. So hard to read, but the 15 tasks listed here are our attempt to kind of break down the leadership duties that could take place across the season 
across the garden. Um, and so we're gonna be digging into the four that are in red today. Um, and we wanna make sure that you know, if you are just able to come today, you're gonna be able to find these resources on our website so you can fill out a full picture of the duties. And if you're bringing someone later on, later in the months ahead, Again, we're, we'll review that and these resources are going to be available in print form as well. So um, we'll follow up with an email uh, with the toolkit resources that we're gonna go through today. We're gonna go through four of the 15 toolkit uh, resources and we'll follow up with those printed materials um, on Wednesday. So feel free to take notes, ask questions today, but a lot of what we're gonna share here verbally over Zoom will have you'll have in written form follow-up coming your way later this week. Any questions before we launch in? Sure. Great, all right, our next one. So for a successful community garden committee, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. What does that even look like? We say, okay, we're hearing from Garden Project, we wanna have a committee. What, how will I know that I've not only made forms of a committee, but it is successful and operational. So to start with, we just wanna emphasize, keep the roles clear, keep them straightforward. We really did our best due diligence to make um, the tasks that, that we're going to share on very clear in what needs to be done. And we're, we're a big fan of the and, understand that flexibility is going to be important. So we may have five bullet points of what that role may look like, but your member and your capacity is really going to be what how, forms how that role is actually uh, implemented. So as much as we're able, let people bring their own um, skills and personality to that role. What else, Matthew? Next slide, we'll make a successful garden committee. One more, please. One, make sure that more than one person knows how to access the essential garden info. You'll know your committee is successful if there's an issue, a large issue that comes up and it's not one person that has the, all the answers to, to solving that issue. That's what a successful garden committee looks like, sh that shared leadership. And then I think lastly, I'll just share a successful community uh, garden committee uh, learns and manages their existing responsibilities before they're taking on more. So absolutely have some big ideas and plans about where you're going to move forward into and great to have things dialed in and operating um, at a pretty high level before you're stretching yourself um, and taking on more. Next, please. All right, so now we're saying that's how that's how it's going to be. That's what a successful garden committee looks like. How do I get those people? How do I encourage others to participate in leadership tasks? So let's spend a couple minutes talking about recruitment of committee members next. So first, you're going to gather your team. You're going to, and there are different ways to do that. We're a big fan of the direct ask, just directly asking having that relationship in place to say, you know me, I know you, I see your skills. I'm wondering if you would be able to bring those skills if you have the capacity to help the garden in this way. So a direct ask with giving a specific way to participate, having that list of toolkits uh, ready and saying, here's where our garden could use some help, would you be willing? Um, and then there are other ways as well. So in addition to the one-on-one -on -one calls or sit-downs that you could be having to make those connections, certainly putting the word out and saying, it might not be you, but would you help me uh, share this? This is where our garden is trying to go. We're trying to recruit more leadership help. Would you help us recruit? You can put up flyers, bulletin boards in the garden, certainly social media and putting out a call. We've been doing that more in-house and we've been seeing good results to that. And then often you might hear about having an elevator speech. We just heard it recently. Instead of an elevator speech or like a one minute pitch of, hey, here's how to get involved with the garden. You could call it a sidewalk talk or a garden pathway talk. So as people are walking by or as the community is walking by, 
and they say, what's going on? And I'm like, how's the season? You are ready. You've thought through, here's the ask that I want to make. Here's the ask of what our garden is trying to work on together. I love this picture. It says Saturdays, communal work time, garden tour, come on out on the first Saturdays of every month. So that's really great. You can go to the next slide, Matthew, to give people who are um, more on the periphery of the garden an easy way to jump in, know what is this place? What's my next step to get involved? So take a look at this. We, we're kind of saying with this visual here that on the outside of that uh, circle, those might be the people who attend an outreach potluck that you put on. They might not be gardeners themselves, but they might stop. And if you have a sharing box out front, you know that they know about that and they come use it. They say hello to you. They give you that head nod when you're working in your plot. You know them as a neighbor and you know that maybe they're active in the neighborhood and they're proud of the garden that you're a part of. So that's, that's your outer periphery of who's gonna be involved. At, at your garden and then going one in the gardeners themselves you know maybe you have 25 maybe you have seven maybe you have 90 but the community get garden members who have a plot of their own not all of those gardeners are probably going to be a next layer down there might be a handful who you know you see them often dragging the hose. They're helping with shared tasks. They're straightening the shed. You notice that they're willing to kind of jump in if a if there's a gap in, in support. Um, they might be the ones that give suggestions to you. They might be the ones that always are showing up and saying, how about we do this? Or why don't we have that? Pick up on that. They, they might be willing to put some of those ideas into action. Um, or they might be the ones that are pretty regularly coming to work days. And then there's the leadership committee themselves. So you can push the next one, Matthew. The, it's the folks that are really, oh, sorry, can you go oh, back sorry. to just the yellow? Um, it's the folks who are really, if you want to take uh, a strategic approach and who you're gonna gather for your team, we just recommend starting with that layer of people who, you have some interaction within the garden. You know them. Maybe they've been there a couple of years. They've been to a couple work days. As far as starting to who you may gather as a team, we'd recommend starting with that group. And then, so that's when that direct ask really comes into play. Okay, thank you. All right, so healthy practices for forming a, a committee. So, um, after you've gathered, you've recruited some leadership assistance and um, people have a bit of buy-in, you're ready to start getting them, getting you all to work. So I do wanna say, continue to invite folks. You might feel good about, even if you had one or two more, you might say, that's great. I'm, I'm ready to roll for the season. I'd say, keep it an open invitation so that people know um, there's a place for them to get involved with garden leadership. And you want to, we often say you do that through building relationships. Um, we want to create a structure where folks have clear roles and can get things done. That is where that toolkit will really come in. Use that as your baseline structure for how people can plug in. And Zoom is great and texting is great and email is great, but we'd really encourage Having 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 a meeting, having a preseason meeting at the very least to set down as a leadership committee, but really what's going to be more successful is having a regular time where you get together and can make decisions and plans in person. You really can't beat that. Setting shared goals is what we'll touch on later and how to do that, where those come from and what that means. But amongst your leadership committee, having everyone on the same page about what the goals are for the season ahead. And we really can't emphasize enough that you wanna do that in a welcoming, enjoyable, friendly environment. People are not showing up to be participating in a community garden or on a leadership capacity so that they can have another high stress, high stakes, tense meeting and uh, group engagement in their life. You know, the garden is, we all know how we feel we're in, when we're in the garden, getting a sense of peace, a, a sense of joy. Let that be the tone in your 
leadership meetings as well. And then as you are in a group, you'll notice that um, you'll start to have a rhythm. You'll start to know this is the set role. We can count on them to work on this timeline. This is the set calendar date when we want to have these tasks done. And then you're going to want to document that so you can start to build out that rhythm and repeat it year after year, not reinventing the, the, um, the wheel each year. So those are some of the healthy practices for garden committees. So next slide as we think about those six items, those six healthy practices for garden committees, everything from having open invitations to creating structures and roles, having meetings that you're setting, setting shared goals, creating a friendly environment for your leadership committee and building rhythms. What two do you feel like you would like to work on in this month ahead? You know, what stage are you in? You're probably not going to be working on building out your friendly environment amongst in your group if you haven't yet formed a group. <laughs> so there's probably one or two items that you think, okay, this is the stage that I'm in. So if you don't mind taking a moment um, to think on that and then put in the chat, what one or two practices would you work on this month in forming a leadership committee? And then what would be your next step in implementing that? And you actually, it's just us. So let's jump off Zoom if that, um, or I'm sorry, jump off mute and share over Zoom if that's easier. I can share. Um, I, I think for for me, um, now that registration is open, I usually send out a like a email to the gardeners from last year saying, "Hey, registration's open," and I could add, you know, some of the info from this with an invite to, "Hey, you know, who's interested?" And I could follow up with a few people that I think might be interested and do the direct ask <laughs> so sorry I'm outside walking I don't know if my face looks funny but no um, you're coming through loud and clear and that's a great idea I really appreciate you sharing we're seeing from Emmanuel next step that came to mind for him would be um inviting folks and creating structures and roles that's great thank you for sharing Emmanuel I just Anita, to... we won't, you don't have to, but if you'd like to, you're welcome. Oh yeah, please share Matthew. I just wanted to say too, when I was on a, a similar meeting to, to this one recently, uh, I, I guess it struck me when I was thinking about how you build up uh, more involvement within a garden that those, in, those direct asks, though they might seem intimidating at times or like maybe, I don't know, maybe it's, you know, you're putting too much pressure on somebody when you think about the ways in which you started to participate in a in some kind of a community project, oftentimes it's because you know a, a friend invited you, somebody invited you. So I think that those are very powerful. Certainly, it's not the only uh, it's not the only tool for for you know grabbing people's attention, but it's an important one. It, it feels so personal and nice when somebody like puts their their finger on you and says, "Hey." figure to finger, um, says, hey, you know, I, I, I think that you'd be really good at this, so. Well, thank you for giving that some, some of that consideration. I mean, what were, we wanted to, we realized it was a gap for us, to be quite honest, when we were putting together this toolkit. We said, here are the tasks, and we're going to teach on that, and then we thought, we, we have to talk about how to actually get people to come help. So all of the things that are about to come next in the session today and um, in the future sessions kind of rest on the idea that there is shared help. So if this is your only takeaway today of if you are just kind of a, a garden leadership committee of one right now, that last few minutes, this these six steps are really going to be your gist for your next step, and the rest are a look ahead. But um, we want you to feel supported, and we want uh, your garden to grow. So we just want to emphasize that. 
So that's recruitment, that's member recruitment, um, garden leadership member recruitment, and I'll pass it to Matthew. Great, thanks so much, Julie. Uh, well, yeah, we're, so what we're doing now is we're gonna dive into uh, some of these very specific tools that are within that broader toolkit that uh, Julie has outlined for us already. So um, we've divided that toolkit into these four different sections. If you think back to that document that was shared on one of the slides. So uh, the tool that we're diving into today is registration, which is a part of this you know broad category of membership stuffs. You know, there's tasks that need to be done within the membership realm. Um, so so yeah, why uh, the, the first I just kind of wanted to speak to some of the the definition or the the logic behind registration. Uh, I mean registration, you, you can probably imagine a garden needs registration because what would happen if a garden didn't have people registering or applying for the space? Uh, it might be uh, chaos. <laughs> so we we want to gather people's information um, in such a way that is going to help us help them. Um, but we we also want to uh, we want to set the set things up so that the garden is gonna ultimately be a, a place of organization and that everybody feels well situated within their plot. So um, so this this happens, I, actually, I, I think in the next slide, I get a little bit into some of the information about the timeline when this is happening. So for all of the different uh, tools that we have within a, a garden or all the different tasks that need to happen, they all happen at a different period of time within the the season so we there are two general categories some of the the tasks that, that we outline on any given seminar are gonna be tasks that kind of go throughout the entire year like needing to maintain the space uh, but there are other tasks that just need to happen at one point in the year they're kind of a heavy hitter but then it's over with uh, which is helpful to think about when you when we're thinking about who within our sphere of the garden may be interested in getting involved in this particular task. Again, that's kind of one of the key questions we want to have in the back of our minds throughout this entire process. Be thinking about like, who would be good to start to get involved in this process? Think about like how to register people. Um, and it's really important upfront to be able to tell people, hey, this happens generally March to May. If we can just make a specific ask of you, uh, could you be involved in this process? You know, it might take uh, a weekend for you to organize people's information, but uh, it's helpful to be able to have those details so we can make a specific ask of folks. Um, I do also want to say on, on this slide, it says, uh, and I, there might be more information on this in future slides. It says that registration often happens between March and May. You can imagine why that's the case. That's we're gathering people's information so that we can get them in the garden for the growing season that you know is starting to kick off by May. Uh, but there are other times you might be able to gather that information anytime from the very end of the previous growing season to the beginning of the new. So you can start to collect people's interest for coming back to the garden at the very end of the previous growing season. Uh, I know we've got uh, gardens in our network that have a potluck at the end of a season, uh, just a way to gather all those gardeners together, another great way to build community. And um, what they what they do at that time is go around and ask people, hey, are you coming back next year? And uh, that's a great way to kind of bolster your, your registration process. So... Let's see. I wanted to uh, give you an example of the information that Garden Project collects for registration. So, and again, uh, maybe another term that you could also use along with registration is that you could also think of it in terms of application. Just because somebody registers or applies for your garden doesn't necessarily mean you have space for all the people who are coming, unfortunately. Uh, so, so that's just something to bear in mind as, as we think about this whole process. 
Uh, and, and I'm going to get into, like, this is a nice online form that Garden Project has set up within our garden network. But uh, I also will be going over that there are different modes that you could be gathering information from people within your community. But right now, I just put this up here as an example of the sorts of different things that you might want to consider gathering from people. So as we think about, like, what what do you really need to know uh, about folks if they want to come and garden within your space? Uh, you know, as the bare minimum, you could just say, oh, I just need to know your name <laughs> so that I can put your name down uh, and that you have a plot. And then when you come and see, hey, there's your name, but probably you need a way to get in touch with them too uh, so that you can let them know that they do have a plot. Uh, so contact information is going to be important there. Also, just knowing their preferred uh, method of contact or, you know, that's also helpful too. There might be people within your network that, they don't really answer their emails, uh, or that's just not a mode of communication that they that they go by, but they're really good at text, uh, or they're really good over Facebook or WhatsApp. Uh, and if you don't know what WhatsApp is, then just, I don't know, I was going to make some bad pun or something. What's WhatsApp? Um, anyway, it's just another app like Facebook. So uh I can't hear people like laugh back at me. So I should have tried to avoid bad puns or something over Zoom. It's just, anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, modes of communication. Uh, it's also good to know uh, in that same vein of what I was just talking about, uh, what's a person's primary language? You might be able to communicate over these channels uh, through phone or text, but, uh, but if English isn't their first or primary language, then you're gonna wanna know that as well. So. so you can see if there are any accommodations you might need to give them. Um, other, and that gets into other things to consider are all in that realm of accommodations. Like, are there other accommodations you might want to consider that you'll want to provide for some of these gardens, gardeners as they, as they apply for space? So uh, it's a, the next question that I have there is just like, it's good to know if they're returning, if they, if they've already been in your space. Uh, if you were uh, coordinating this process within a garden, you would probably already know that, but still good to just have a way of quickly ascertaining that information. And then uh, another really good bit of information to have from people is during the time of registration, as much as we can, we wanna try to gather that information. Hey. Are you interested in participating in in the garden committee and you know taking on some of these specific tasks? It's good to be able to make that ask in as many different venues and places as you can. Um, and then, just as a general question, it's good to know, like, hey, are there any accommodations that you might have uh, within this registration process? We ask if people are under sixty or over sixty. That can be helpful for knowing where you might want to place gardeners, like put them close to the watering system and the spigot, uh, rather than making it so that they have to hike across the, the garden just to carry a bucket of water. It's also nice to know sometimes if people are new gardeners or if they're intermediate or if they're very experienced. Uh, what Garden Project has done at, at some gardens is if somebody's a new gardener, you can sometimes give them a smaller plot, which I think I'll get into in the next slide. So I'm gonna kind of push through and just read through some of this content uh, pretty quickly because I've got a few more slides, but I wanna give space for the next part of the presentation. So as I said before, member registration can really vary from a, a friendly phone call to a full length form like the one that I just went over. Uh, and then as you're developing these registration processes, just think strategically choose questions and information that'll be helpful through, for the entire season. So just think carefully about what it is you really need to know. Uh, and as I said earlier, collecting registration information can happen as early as the fall uh, or as late as the spring. And also another important point is to think about making registration available when you already have gardeners attention at events. So any event is a, is a good time like that, end of the year pot like the previous season. 
And then uh, another piece of information that can be good to know is just you can directly ask people what plot they want and why. That'll help you understand where they, you know, if there's something that might need to change within a particular plot, if it has bad soil or drainage or something like that. Uh, that's important feedback to get from people. And then uh, provide, provide clear expectations and consequences for not registering by a specific time. So there's, there's just got to be some structure within a community garden so that things can start at an appropriate date for everyone. And maintaining a wait list encourages early signups, which can be helpful during the preseason planning. So having that wait list is, is helpful for people who might not be able to get in immediately, but um, helpful for your tracking their information. And uh, just a couple more slides on this subject, uh, diversity and accessibility. Garden Project prioritizes diversity in food growing gardens. We just wanted to speak a little bit about uh, some of the priorities that we have here at Garden Project. Uh, there's lots of different types of diversity, but we, we just want to make sure that there's ways that you can gather that within your, uh, within your registration process uh, so that you can so that you can try to create and foster that, that value within your garden. And then additionally, registration could include a question that asks about any accommodations that a gardener may need, which I've, I've already covered a bit. But language translation is an important one here as we're thinking about, uh, as we're thinking about diversity. And just know that uh, Garden Project is here to help support you in that. When Stevie was introducing herself, she mentioned that she's a new American specialist. So you can always reach out to Stevie and us here at Garden Project for assistance. And lastly, uh, some communication tips uh, include garden guidelines and expectations within the registration information. You could link to that if you're doing something over email or uh, develop an active and inclusive membership by communicating additional requirements at registration like committee service, work days, meetings, and events. I, think that can, I wish I had more time to emphasize that. Maybe we'll talk more about it later, but right at the outset, it's great to set the expectations. I would really highlight that specific point. Uh, right at the beginning, it's, it's just good to set those, those expectations. Like when you expect people to show up throughout the season and have specific dates already set uh, and just what you're asking of your members. So it's good to set the bar a little bit higher and say, hey, uh, being a part of this garden may, but it does involve, you know, participating in these concrete ways. And then be consistent with those expectations throughout the whole year and uphold those guidelines. You know, the guidelines don't do any good unless you have a way to follow up with people and make sure that they're, they're sticking with it. So uh, a prompting question for you guys is if you were going to take the applications or registration, how and when would you gather that information? What would seem the most appropriate to you? Uh, would you start to gather that information over phone, email, a paper form that you get to people, Google, and why would you do that? So feel free to unmute yourself if you wanna to respond to that. We'd love to hear some of your responses or just type it into the chat. I'll just leave a few seconds for you all to share on that point. Or if you have any other questions that came up over the past few minutes, feel free to shoot them out there. Am I unmuted? Yep. Okay. Um, my preference because of our church and our uh, people in our church is usually paper forms because they're older and they usually don't use the emails, et cetera, or texting. And, but we do periodically send out emails to them. And uh, thank you very much for the information on more things for us to put, put on our, our uh, registration for the people. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, Bonita. <laughs> Yeah, this, this point about not everybody being tech savvy, I think is an important point for accessibility too. 
having those modes of reaching out to people that isn't all just techie. It's good. Thanks, Emmanuel. Juanita, to your point about asking those extra questions, we've done um, surveys in the past. We've tried mid-season surveys. You know, how's it going? What would you like more of? Post-season right. surveys. And we've really found that um, if we want the most responses, we need to put those, any extra questions on the registration form. So sometimes we're even asking questions about how was your season last year? You know, you know, how much did you grow? And anything that we might think at any point in the season we'd want to know to try to get it on that early season application, um, you know, if they want, if you want any feedback. And we also, it's, we're also always trying to make things as accessible and streamlined as possible. So you'll know your community best about um, is a three page registration form with every question under the sun going to be off putting or is it like, nope, this is our one chance to really get a full sense of the person and how we can build a relationship and serve them better. You know, so it's always a balance, but yeah, asking up front can be a really good technique. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm going to feel free to continue to ask questions. Uh, you know, if you want to talk more about that point, we'll have a summary at the end. I went really long, Stevie, so you get to, you can go as short as you want. <laughs> so, but uh, now we're going to go. Talk fast. <laughs> we did have some comments in the chat, though, too, about, um, you know, using phone and email um, because everyone might not be tech savvy, but also like the benefits of online forms where you can link it to emails and social media. So, it's hard to say do a little bit of everything, but sometimes it's just nice to have another option every once in a while. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm doing the community building section. Um, so on the, whoop. Right. You take a one? Thank you. <laughs> uh, the community building section portion of the tasks uh, is about community building and outreach with garden members and the greater community. So your neighbors, all that kind of stuff. Um, next slide, please. I'll jump again. So the specific task we're talking about here is member communication. Uh, and this is kind of broken up into two parts. So it's it's not going to be your um, you know, leading your spring orientation or mass garden uh, announcements, things like this. This task is more about the one-on-one -on -one specific gardener communication uh, when a plot becomes weedy or abandoned and has to be reassigned. Um, and the second part is really dealing with like the interpersonal issues that might arise in the garden. Um, and generally this will probably involve some conflict management skills. Um, next slide, please. So just some quick like keys to success here um, is really just being consistent in how you implement your guidelines. Um, having templates and step-by-step -step procedures are so important and making sure that you're documenting everything. Every time you talk to somebody about something or take action for something, um, that way you'll know the next year because Lord knows I can't remember what I did last week, let alone last year. So really making sure you're writing that down and recording it um, is incredibly helpful. And really a part of this is not taking anything personally. So it's it's, it's just such a key to conflict management is just always assuming best intentions and coming from a place of how can I support you and how can I help you? Um, a lot of conflicts come out of miscommunications or a lack of comprehensive and written garden policies that weren't communicated um, in as many ways as possible, honestly. And I think we can always, if you're involved with the garden or really any group of people, you know that conflict will always happen. And it might not be a big thing, it might be a small misunderstanding, but it will always happen. And if we can learn to be a little more proactive about it instead of reactive, it'll it'll go a long way into averting a lot of those issues we'll have with miscommunications. Next slide, please. So I have a possible scenario for you and I'm, Sure, actually, we've all probably been through this scenario at this point. But Sue has a weedy plot. You've asked her multiple times to weed. Other gardeners have offered to help. She always responds that she will take care of it soon. But it has been a month, and the weeds are encroaching into the neighbor's space and are about to set seed. So hopefully her garden doesn't look quite as bad as the garden pictured, 
Um, <laughs> but what the best possible result, I should add a caveat here. The best possible result would be that she goes in, weeds her garden, and everybody's happy. Um, but assuming that that doesn't happen at this point, um, it reminds Sue that she received a copy of the Gardener Handbook at the beginning of the season, which was also emailed to her, and that she agreed to abide by the garden's guidelines. You have emailed her a photo of her plot and set a deadline of two weeks. You followed up with a phone call and an offer of help, all of which you documented. And now, per the garden's procedures, you must weed whack and tarp her plot, and she might not receive a plot next year. So, next slide, please. These are some of the important steps that you would have gone through for that to be the best possible scenario is you set clear guidelines and processes at the beginning of the season. She received the guidelines through email, maybe a paper copy. They were covered in the spring orientation, um, multiple formats. She maybe signed something that she agrees to these guidelines. Um, you confronted her, you talked to her, you were very straightforward about the problem. You communicated a deadline. She knew it was coming and you documented everything. So you have, you can show her that you, you talked to her on these dates and you know, this was her response um, and consequences. Although it might seem harsh, they were the agreed upon procedures from the garden. And it's really important, especially for your benefit, if you're the person dealing with the conflict here, it's really important for your benefit to realize that this is not you. This is not you making these rules. These were the agreed upon garden rules for the health of the garden. So really making sure you communicate that as well. And then following through, you, you weed whipped and tarped the plot. Next slide, please. So it's really important when dealing with one-on-one -on -one member communication to really be direct about the issue and offer ways to solve it. One of the best things you can do is frame the issues as outside of the other person. So the problem is not Sue, the problem is a weedy garden. Um, and how, how do we work with Sue to fix that problem? And that kind of framing really helps keep people from taking it personally and makes the, the other person a little more receptive to your solutions or whatever their solutions are. Um, and if someone does get defensive, it's okay to stop the conversation and take a moment to step out of it and reset trust and affirm goals. So really using a good script of like, I I understand that, you know, uh, you, you just had a baby. I understand that that just, that sucked up all your time. And maybe at the beginning of the year, you thought you could do garden and a baby, but it was a little more than you thought. <laughs> I get it. But we both want Risdale Garden to be successful and a beautiful space for everybody. So how are we going to do this going forward? So really taking that moment to make sure everybody's feeling safe and on the same page, um, that goes a lot. And the thing about this position is hopefully, hopefully it's somebody who really gets energized by meeting other people and talking with people and, you know, really gets to know the other gardeners. So when you do have a conflict, you're coming, you're coming to them with a mutual understanding and some shared trust where, you know, they know you, you're a friend, um, it shouldn't generally be a surprise. But if you do have all of those processes and procedures written down and in place um, beforehand, and this person might not be doing that, you might just be implementing the processes, but making sure you're doing it consistently and evenly and equitably with everyone. And if you do make exceptions, because, you know, sometimes life does happen. We have exceptions. You know, we we have babies. We have deaths in the family. We our car breaks down, we go on vacation, something happens, you win the lottery and you just don't feel you have to garden anymore. <laughs> you know, whatever happens, like as long as you are helping implement those procedures equitably and if you are making exceptions, making sure you're recording why and how you made that exception, um, that will be so important. Next slide, please. So I recommend this book. Um, this is I, I do a lot of mediating between cultures uh, in my position, and I highly recommend the Crucial Conversations book. <laughs> Matthew's already got it. Matthew's reading it. Spreading the good word of the Crucial Conversations book. Uh, 
it it provides a great framework for having more difficult conversations and sometimes just good script for easy conversations. But um, when you really do have to have that more intense, deeper conversation with someone who you know might not quite be as receptive to what you have to say, um, I highly recommend this book. Um, and even if you just read the first chapter in it, it gives you a great overview of the whole rest of the thing. Um, I also re recommend this article, and you can probably just Google the title because I realized I hyperlinked it, but you can't click the hyperlink, so that's not incredibly helpful. I'll drop that in chat, actually. I'll drop a link to that article in chat. Um, I, I'm sure we've all heard at one point the sandwich method, which is like a good thing, a bad thing, and then a good thing. Um, they've actually done more research, and it turns out that it's not the best way to give somebody negative feedback because your message kind of gets lost like what you're trying to do gets lost in between the good things. Um, so they did, this article does, oh, thank you, Julie. <laughs> uh, this article offers alternatives, which I thought was incredibly helpful of like being direct and giving you some ideas of how you can approach negative feedback or, you know, behavior modification feedback um, in a way that people will still find receptive. Uh, does anyone oh, does anyone have any questions at the moment about member communication? Or it can also be fun. It doesn't have to be negative all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, next slide, then, please. So, what, what advice does he, do you have for conflict management? I'm sure we've all had conflict in our lives, and it's always nice to get advice from other people's experiences. I've never had any conflict, so I just can't. Man with three kids and a dog, yeah. Oh, there are no sudden movements. There you go. <laughs> That's a good one. Yep. Direct, honest, transparent. How will I choose? Hmm? Um, and Julie says, how, how will I choose to respond when I feel annoyed, overwhelmed, and put in the same spot? Yeah, empathy is a huge thing. You know, trying to imagine how someone else feels. No sudden movements. Yeah, that one is really important too because it's easy to like jump to a jump to an action sometimes we some, you know it's that fight or flight response of like we just want to do something sometimes or and sometimes you know people just need an extra moment or we all need an extra moment to think about it and I think that's where you know having those written procedures in place too kind of helps because it doesn't it it gives you a, a steps to follow so you don't just jump right to well we're going to tarp your plot now <laughs> And I will say that example came from a real garden and I, that is their procedure. They will weed whack and tarp your plot. And I think they've only actually done it once though in like the five years that they've had that garden leader. So. <laughs> All right, well, great. Thank you guys. That was great advice. Um, and if nobody has any other questions, I will hand it off. Great. Well, it's me again. Uh... We are gonna step into the next task, which is a maintenance task. Uh, so this is gonna have to do with the upkeep uh, of the, the physical space, physical stuff. So there's a big difference between a lot of what we've been talking this morning between uh, around coordinating people stuff, social things, and the physical aspects of a garden. In some ways, the physical aspect may seem a little bit easier, but uh, or, or it could be seen as easier, but it still involves people, of course. All of these involve people. It's a community garden. Uh, so so even if we're figuring out how to coordinate physical needs, uh, that still involves working with folks. Thus, this one is about workday coordination. Oh, yeah. So uh, because there are many tasks around a garden that would really benefit from having multiple hands on there. I'm sure we've all heard the, the old saying that many hands 
make light work. And there are just some things around the garden where that's particularly true. So there kind of needs to be somebody though to coordinate that whole process to, to get that actually happening, to get all those people within the space. So, so this task is just about hosting gardeners or visiting and or visiting volunteers uh, by giving them guidance, providing the tools that are necessary, all the supplies and just coordinating all the work that happens. So uh, this, the, the time commitment for this one is, you know, it happened throughout the year, but generally this is happening throughout the, the season as needed. So the keys to success for this are to have a good way of documenting a list of projects that you need volunteers for, for any given year. So it's great to kind of have in your back pocket someplace or, you know, where you can just say, hey, I, I know that we're gonna need volunteers for managing the pathways, for instance, as you see these lovely folks on this picture doing so. They're, looks like they're spreading some mulch down, which will help with suppressing the weeds. Another key to success for the actual work day is to be a good host. <laughs> you know, people aren't gonna wanna come back for a work day if again, it just wasn't fun for them. <laughs> so think about how to make it a good time for people. Um, and then the last key to success, we're gonna dig into some of these details here, is uh, just to know the garden project is available to help connect you to volunteers. And uh, especially we've got a great tool lending library for anybody who's within our network uh, for larger projects. So as you can see, these folks have a bunch of rakes. We've got lots of rakes, uh, shovels and such, uh, and some specialized tools too. So, uh, so there are two main types of workday workdays. Uh, and I, I've already spoken a little bit about them, but uh, one is with fellow gardeners. So uh, as I think I, I mentioned in my previous presentation, uh, setting those expectations early within registration can be helpful to schedule in the workdays in advance so that people know, hey, uh, when I registered for the garden and I was accepted and I went through the orientation, it was on the calendar that on July 13th, on that Saturday, there's a workday. And I, you know, there's, you can make them mandatory as, as well, uh, which says, hey, you know, we, we want people to show up to at least one of these work days throughout this year. So obviously you're not gonna schedule in work days, uh, you know, every weekend within a community garden, but maybe two to four times a year might be acceptable throughout the growing season and trying to situate them at key times when you know uh, the tasks that you need multiple people there for are, are gonna be rising up. So when things are getting really weedy, so on and so forth. I'm going to ask you guys later when you think, like what sorts of tasks you want volunteers for, because I'm, I'm really interested to hear your responses on that. So I'm, I'm like avoiding that, <laughs> that answer. Uh, the other great thing that this does when you're working with, when you're, when you're doing a workday for the garden or for and with the gardeners within the garden is that it really helps that foster that community aspect of the community garden. Uh, if it's be if it's a, a fun time, if it's a potluck uh, at the end, then it just it's not a time where people are going to feel like oh I have to go to the workday. Uh, instead, this is an opportunity for people to look forward to going and talking with others, learning from them as you all participate in a shared task together. Second type of workday is with outside volunteers. Now, uh, this is, in, well, they both require a lot of coordination, but this can be a great opportunity to build connections between the gardeners within your space and the wider community. Uh, and if you need help connecting with volunteer groups, uh, just know that we're here to help support you with that as well. If you go to Garden Project's website, you can be connected to the food bank's larger volunteer network, which is, is vast. We're a, a pretty significantly sized nonprofit and we, we have a connection to lots of different volunteer groups from different corporations and businesses and partners uh, throughout the mid-Michigan area. Or 
you can also consider posting volunteer opportunities online and connect, building those connections directly um, yourself. So there's different websites you can go to, such as Volunteer Match, Idealist, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, or just connecting more locally with, with businesses or uh, trying to have a presence with those who are nearby your garden. So those are the two main types. Uh, regardless of whether or not you're working with outside volunteers or inside volunteers, uh, you're, I wanted to kind of just do a quick overview of what is involved in hosting an actual volunteer day. Uh, this will be a, an appendix item that we have listed with this particular tool that we're gonna share and make available to you all on our website. Uh, so I won't go through this in too much detail, but the first part is just that in order to have a successful work day, there's a good bit of prep that goes into it. So keep a running list of the physical tasks that require more than one person. Um, and collect all the supplies you need. You can see there's a long bullet list there of things you're gonna to wanna to have on hand, such as gloves. You know, I, I like working with my bare hands and getting it into the dirt. I find that like 90% of people who come to work at a garden actually like to wear gloves, so whatever. <laughs> uh, trash bags are often needed for gathering waste material or totes for recycling that or putting it in the compost. <laughs> It's good to have a volunteer sign in check-in sheet so that you can track who's who's arrived. Um, and then other other needs uh, supplies too, depending on the season, like sunscreen, bug spray, having a first aid kit is always a good idea. Always good to uh, to communicate with people beforehand as well. So the day of on a work day, uh, it's just good to, to follow, to have something of an agenda to follow where you have a good introduction, you welcome people. You know, if, if you're coming to a work day, you kind of want to be welcomed into the space rather than just like have a bunch of people like raise their head and say, oh, hey, you know, pick up a shovel and get to work. So good to have a good start time, orient people to the space, let them know where there's a restroom. Lord willing, there's a restroom. <laughs> there should be close by. Um, and, uh, and again, that's a time where you can remind people to sign in. Uh, then during the time, as the, the this is really critical, as the workday leader, your main task is hosting. Your main task is not doing the work. Uh, you're kind of the manager. You're, you're like the little butterfly who's going around and checking in on people and making sure that people are, are doing good, they're feeling good, they've got what they need. Uh, you, know, you can supply them with trash bags, make sure that they have uh, sunscreen, bug spray, whatever, whatever they need in order to keep going. And it's, it's also helpful because you're able to help guide people where there's a gap that's, that needs filling. You can say, hey, could you, could you go join this team of two people over here? Because they, they need a third, something along those lines. And then uh, last part of the day when everybody's there is just making sure that you leave ample time for cleanup. So the workday, you, know, you, you always want to leave like a good 15 to 20 minutes uh, before when people are expecting to leave, say, hey, okay, now we need to get started with cleanup so that you're not left you know, having to clean up for an hour afterwards and pick up all the bags. It's, it's a lot easier to do that if everybody's still around. And then that makes for a nice handy closing at the end where you can gather everybody together, maybe take another picture, like an after picture where I didn't mention it was, it was listed here, but you can take a before and after picture. That's always fun. Good to, be able to take a picture, especially for those outside groups that might come in. You can share that picture with them afterwards. It's great, you know, then they can have that for their business and post it on their Facebook page or something like that. <laughs> um, and then it's uh, after the workday meeting, always great to follow up with people um, and you know, send them a thank you card or an email. So as I alluded to already, uh, I'd be really interested to hear your guys' thoughts on what work tasks do you think would most need volunteers within your community garden, and when would you need them? Again, feel free to just talk it out over Zoom or, or interact with the chat. When do you need lots of people, lots of hands? Uh, 
Oh, thanks, Susan. I think we need volunteers for all tasks, but I'm interested in gauging their interest to see what they would like to do. Oh, yeah. Wood chip spreading. Garden trash pickup. Harvesting crops that might go to waste and donate it. Cool. <laughs> nice. That's great that you're interested in reaching out to community groups to, to help. That's fantastic, Susan. Yeah, these are all great ideas. I think uh, we, uh, you know, weeding is a common one too. Uh, maintaining paths, perimeters around a, a garden fence. It's always needed. That kind of fits in with what Julie Julie's comment was on, on spreading wood chips. Once you weed, you gotta cover up the space so, so that the weeds don't just come right back. Yeah. Great, thank you for, for engaging with the chat there, everybody. Uh, again, if there's any questions that you wanna shoot out there and follow up with later, that'll be great. Otherwise, we are gonna keep moving right along and into the next section. So we're on to another coordination topic. I think this is you, right, Julie? Sorry, I wasn't muted. I was still muted. Yes, that's me. So um, I hope it doesn't feel too sporadic. I mean, I just want you all to know that we tried to strategically take a task from each different um, type of leadership committee duties that, and then share them in the time frame that you'd be working on it shortly. So that's why we tackled registration right now. And that's why we're tackling, you know, coordinating your um, all garden communication. So um, I think if you haven't yet um, gotten the toolkit sheet, which we is on our website, and I'll show you where that is later, um, that will really kind of help lay this out. So we're going to a coordination duty right now. And I want next slide, we'll share um, what some of those are. So one of the coordinating duties is to serve as the liaison to GLFB Garden Project. So that means both sharing the updates that Garden Project will send to you as uh, one of the leadership committee members, and then sharing back with us at Garden Project updates on your garden, including when the garden is full. So you can go to the next one, Matthew. So as a liaison to GLFB, um, we really like having a sense of what your garden is like. So we do that kind of for our own internal purposes so that we can channel support and um, channel accurate, helpful resources to you. And we like to know so that we can share that on in a public facing sense um, for the requests that we get in. So on our general line, when somebody's calling and saying, I'm new to the area or I'm ready to start gardening, can you help me find a community garden? That's one um, thing that we love to be able to help people do, find that direct connection to a community garden that's going to be a good fit for them. So you'll see um, on that slide that you can search by map and then list out all the gardens in the network. And if you click the next one, Matthew, you'll see after you click on one of those, you'll go to the gardens page and we can put any information that you would like on that page. Um, we can put up your supporting docs, your guidelines, your a, a survey that you might be trying to get information on or a registration form. So um, I also wanna emphasize that it's good to have contact information both for your garden um, in general and on certainly if it's going to be online, how do I get in touch with this garden? And we'd encourage setting up a Google account for your garden. So if that hasn't happened yet, you might just choose, you know, I see Michelle on the call and she might say Mount Hope 
garden lansing you know at gmail.com and that way um, you cannot have your personal information up there if you are going to be the contact for that garden and that builds in some long-term record keeping for your garden as well where um, if you are stepping down as someone in that coordinating role you can pass along a whole email account all those uh, previous templates that you might have created and you know, follow-up emails for volunteers, gardens, and such. So that's really nice to have an account travel with the garden. Okay, so um, next slide, please. So when you, oops, my arrows got a little off. More to come on that slide. So the way you're going to hear about um, information coming from Garden Project is, yes, we'll have information going out to community gardens from Matthew. So we want to make sure there's someone from your community garden giving uh, info that we have to share too. We'll continue to send supporting documents with this um, leadership training in particular. We'll have Friday drop-in hours at our Garden Project Resource Center for leadership committee members um, beginning in May and running through the end of June. So you can always find us there. Um, we don't have this listed, but certainly uh, a phone call is always welcome and preferred. And then a web page. So um, I'll drop that in the chat in a moment too. But the link to our leadership committee resources web page is um, new and being regularly uh, added to. So when you're on the GLFP page, you'll go to the community garden section. And that will, you'll see a drop down box then that will take you to the uh, committee resources page. So that's where the toolkit is, where that red arrow is. Um, next, could you tap the next one, Matthew? I want to highlight the Lansing Area Community Garden uh, Resource Guide. All of you as community garden leader uh, committee members could take a look at that. And that has a guide on how to access res uh, resources beyond garden project as well. That could be really helpful. The maintenance assistance request that he just highlighted is the form. If something breaks at the garden and there's not really internal capacity to um, fix that and you'd like to request a site visit and a consult for how to fix something, that's our maintenance assistance form. The next arrow he'll pop up there highlights our resource request form for compost and wood chips, which Stevie also dropped in the chat. So if you're in need of one of those wonderful volunteer groups that Matthew highlighted, that's where you'll make that request. And then last arrow, please, Matthew, the garden improvement grant application is how you as a leadership committee member can request improvement funds for your garden. So that's up to $500. So again, we'd like to not have any gardener and any garden request that. It's someone from the leadership committee who's the liaison to garden project can make that request. Next, please. The other part of being um, a, a coordinating uh, committee member would be to be the facilitator. So uh, hopefully you'll have um, multiple committee members, but having someone who says, I will bring us together to facilitate committee meetings. I will bring those gardener suggestions in to us so we can discuss it, we can develop um, some shared goals, and then we I can help, help track that progress of our garden schools. Next, please. So I wanna dig in a little bit on, so you have, if you're saying, yes, I will be that facilitator, what that could look like for you. So you're gonna host, and again, we wanna say, openly advertise uh, open meetings that your leadership uh, committee will be getting together. Gauge those committee members so you know what is an accessible time and location. It very well could be um, if people are not working um, in the morning. If they have a work weekends, it might need to be evening. So you'll want to get so, gather some information first. Great if it can be child friendly um, and just say, you know, please don't, if, don't worry about getting childcare. If you want to help be on this leadership committee, just bring your kiddos with you. They can they can be part of this too, that that should not be a, just to put that out there, I think could be really helpful um, for parents who know, I don't know, I don't, I'd like to help with this, but you know, I've got my kids with me. That's fine. You know, if, if they have, they're always welcome. Always great to have food. I just say, 
I'm so much more prone to be excited to go to a movie if I know somebody says like, oh, let's just bring some crackers and cheese. I'm like, great. I'll, I'll crackers and cheese. I'll be there. <laughs> Um, and then if you are going to have those open regular meetings, making it a part to just explain the background acronyms that you may have, just things that might, um, you might glaze over a bit. And we're prone to do that too, of just always making sure that you're having a welcoming, um, open dialogue so that anyone at any point can jump in. And I emphasized this before, but having it be social, you know, this is this is somebody's volunteer time. They're spending time because they want to help with the garden leadership. So set a sociable time uh, tone so that people can share how they're doing um, and seeking the seeking and valuing input from all members. Next one, please, Matthew. So what that really looks like is a happy meeting that is. Um, Facilitators are prepared and the participants are prepared. The timing, not going too long, not going too short. Your meeting goals, if there is conflict, you've, you're addressing it and you're addressing it with care. And the conversations and the decisions that are made feel very clear. And um, maybe they weren't easy, but always great if, if they do. That's a happy meeting. What that doesn't look like, Matthew, is a, uh, are we done yet? type meeting. Um, so he'll click on that and we'll see that prompt of what that feels like. That's, we've all probably been there. You just show and you're like, I don't know what this vibe is here. Or maybe it just wasn't set intentionally. There wasn't the time to gather people together as you sit down and say, we're so grateful we're here. What a great opportunity that we have a chance to dig into our garden right now. If people don't seem ready, if it feels rushed or too long, goals aren't being, being met, Conflict is either ignored or it feels overwhelming um, if the meeting is hard to follow or if it takes forever to make a decision together. So next slide, please. So what that means is that we're coming as a, a committee facilitator, coming prepared. We're listening carefully, trying to guide without controlling. You do not in this role need to feel like I must control every decision that's being made in the garden. You're really there in this role to be more of a guide to bring ideas forward. Um, and just understand that your, if you, this is a role you take on, your energy is high impact. And what I mean by that is the energy you bring to that meeting will probably be reciprocated. You know, if you're trudging in, uh, you know, just feeling frustrated about everything, it's okay to be frustrated, but also setting the tone of let's move forward together. Um, great to check in regularly during those meetings. And then what the ultimate goal is, is striving for that balance between good connection as you sit down as a leadership committee and getting things done. Just one without the other is not going to be productive. Um, so I just think putting that out there from the very beginning, thank you group for getting together. Here's what we're aiming for. Let's do this together where we can connect in a friendly, supportive environment and get things done for the garden. Next slide. All right, this is the last little bit I'm going to share on goals. So um, a lot of times people as they're setting goals for the garden are thinking about, all right, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And I just want to make mention that starting with the why and always drilling back to, well, why are we so concerned about having the wood chips down or having the produce picked or whatever it might be? Always knowing why you're setting a goal, that is that is where we start. Next, please, Matthew. Especially helpful because one of the roles of the facilitator is to um, bring the gardener suggestions to the leadership committee. And that can be a really important question for the gardener to answer about, okay, I hear you that you want more of this or less of this, getting the why. And then that helps them align those suggestions with, is that in alignment with the mission and the purpose of this garden? Next, please. So setting shared goals, two questions to ask yourself as you're setting shared goals as a garden committee. 
what impact do we envision for the garden? These might be physical goals of like having increased yields or creating a gathering space in the season ahead. These might be social, educational, or involvement goals, like we want to just beautify the space, we want to create more food access. And then after you've identified the impact that you're envisioning for the garden, you can ask this next question, Matthew, of what will we do to work toward these goals? And it might be, as he'll share, These are the outcomes. This is what we're going to work on. We're going to work on soil improvement or installing a seeding, planting natives, or growing food to donate. And on our last slide here, Matthew, we want to introduce and make sure you're aware of SMART goal setting. So as you're developing those goals as a committee, one way that's going to move that into the action phase is making sure that your goals are SMART. So that is the goal is written out as a specific goal, a measurable goal, achievable, realistic, and timely. So what that might look like for that gathering space is like we will have this many benches and a play area built by this particular date, by this group that we're hosting and that we've fundraised for through increased plot fees and a plant sale. So having your goals written out in that smart way is actually then creating your action steps for moving forward. All right, so I'd like to leave you with this prompt. And that's a lot, you guys. We've done um, like three hour trainings <laughs> before on some of the things I just breezed through. So I wanna come back to that first question though. And I'd like you to either come off mute and share or share in the thoughts. As you're thinking back to the why, what impact do you envision for your garden in this season ahead? And I can also say, if you need to ask a clarifying question for anything I just breezed through, now's a great time to do that too. More participation and cooperation, cohesion, sharing of knowledge. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll share some follow-up resources on these items too, but I'll toss it to Matthew to wrap us up. Great. Well, uh... As we are wrapping it up here in just a, a couple minutes, um, just wanted you all to think about, uh, you know, it's kind of helpful at the end of any seminar like this, uh, just what's one idea that resonated with you and uh, how you could start to, uh, and start to think about how you could put that into action. Julie just shared that SMART goals slide. Um, hopefully some of you are familiar with SMART, you know, setting SMART goals, specific, measurable, realistic, timely, all of that stuff. Um, so think about uh, what's one thing that resonated with you and how you might be able to put that into action in the coming season. Again, as Julie mentioned, I hope that this format is making sense. If you have any feedback that you'd like to give, feel free to pop that in the chat. Uh, at, you know, the reason that we're going over this uh, this format here within the seminars uh, here's a schedule of all the seminars that we're going to be giving this year. You can kind of see if you look at some of the rows. We had our kickoff seminar already. That's the one that is at the top left. We're right now in the preseason seminar in the virtual one. And we're just trying to cover a, a seasonally appropriate task that needs to happen for that point in the year. So that's why we're talking about registration, because registration is pertinent to, to this time. And it's also good to just be thinking about member communication, workday coordination, being a liaison, setting garden goals ahead of the season rather than in June. So great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for interacting with the chat there, Emmanuel and Susan. Recruitment strategies, awesome.
Yeah, that's good about creating a Google account. Thanks for that tip, Julie. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all the links, Stevie. We appreciate that. Yeah, and having a calendar ahead of time too. It's an important tool. So, uh, fantastic. Well, the, the other reason that I had that uh, seminar schedule up here too is just you are, of course, very welcome and invited to come join us next time. Uh, and that's going to be on Saturday, April 6th. In the meantime, if you need anything from us, uh, if you would like further information, please feel free to reach out to Julie or myself. Our contact information is right there. Uh, again, we're going to share this webinar, uh, or it's, it is shareable. So I've got a recording here that I'll end in just a few moments. But uh, but just know that you can you can always listen back to this, and you have access to these slides if there's any information here that you want to refer back to. So, any last minute questions before uh, we we end? We are happy to some? stay on with anyone. Yeah. This is your time for questions or anything. So just don't have to. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. We're not in a rush. I just. I just want to be cognizant. Uh, it's 11.30 now for anybody who is hoping to say, hey, this was a 90-minute seminar. <laughs> but but yeah, we're, we're happy to continue to stay on if anybody has any questions. Thank you all. Oh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for interacting with the chat. Right. Okay.